annoying when you set your alarm for 4am and wake up to weather like this. No hint of a sunrise. There's a storm brewing, but it's not the one that's whipping across this Welsh moor. No, no, no. This is an eight-cylinder, 6.2-litre kind of thunder. Mercedes AMG Black Series and soaking wet hillside roads, they tend not to mix. But at least nobody else has been stupid enough to get up this early on a day like today, so the roads are deserted. Based on the standard and very flabby CLK 63, the Black Series arrived in 2007. No more than 600 were built. It was the second AMG to use the Black Series badge after the SLK 55. It arrived during a period of transition for Mercedes AMG. For the longest time, Mercedes high performance division built very powerful sledgehammers, fast but blunt saloons, coupes and roadsters. But with the SLK 55 and CLK 63 Black Series, AMG started to sharpen up its act. Nowadays, AMG builds some of the sharpest performance cars on the road. Think the GTR, the GTR Pro, and then soon the AMG One hypercar will arrive as one of the cleverest performance cars ever built. And they all owe something to this CLK 63 Black Series. Former AMG boss Tobias Merz was quoted as saying the CLK 63 Black Series was the most complete car his company had built up until then. It was his pop at the Porsche 911 GT3. It is pretty hardcore, he said. We got down to a 7 minute 52 lap at the ring and that was in traffic. 7.52 is quick, but these days front wheel drive hot hatches do that. You really get a sense when driving this car though of AMG learning, learning how to make a performance car sharper and more agile and more responsive, learning how to improve grip and traction, learning how to clamp down a body rather than letting it be floaty and heavy and lazy like AMG's were before this car. I've never driven the standard CLK 63 that this Black Series is based on, but I bet it feels like a bus compared to this thing. A wet hillside road is not really where a Black Series belongs. And this car, it can be intimidating. You have to build your confidence in this car over time and learn to trust it, learn how much grip it's got, learn how much traction there is to lean on. And then you start to gel with the car and you can start driving it really hard. Even so, in these conditions, it can be a tricky car. The tires don't much like standing water and the traction control system seems pretty rudimentary. So you can put your foot down, the rear axle will break free, the car will start skidding a little bit and only then will you see the lights start blinking. You have to be on your game to drive this thing in the wet. Woo! It's a slightly wild ride, this thing. One of the issues is it's not a communicative car, not at all. The steering is actually really numb. There's no sense of connection to the front axle. And when you put the car into a corner, the steering doesn't load up. It doesn't weight up the way you think it should do. So you're left guessing how much grip those front tires are actually finding. But there's so much about the way this car gets along a road that's brilliant. I love the mechanical LSD in the rear axle. It locks up so sweetly and so predictably that you just know exactly how much throttle you can chuck at the car before the rear end will break traction. And if you've got the traction control system off, you can really feel that each millimeter of travel that you give the throttle, you're gonna get a bit more wheel spin and a bit more angle at the rear end. It's so predictable and readable in that sense. The suspension is really good as well. I mean, it's firm, properly firm, but this car has got manually adjustable dampers for bump and rebound. So you can more or less choose your own settings. And you can tell that this particular one has been set up by someone who really knows what they're doing because despite all that spring rate, the car is beautifully damped. So it deals with a bumpy road so well. It's remarkable, actually. This car has a centerpiece and it is without question that 6.2 litre normally aspirated V8. <laughs> what an engine it is. It's gorgeous. Of course, it's the same 6.2 V8 that 
AMG used in E63s and C63s and all sorts of other cars. I adore this engine. It's strong, it's got bundles of torque, such a good mid-range, but then it spins beyond 7,000 RPM. It sounds fantastic. It's not overdone either. It's not sort of comically loud. There are no contrived pops and bangs going on. What I like about it is that you feel like you're hearing the engine as much as you're hearing the exhaust note. It's so good to listen to and it's not unnecessarily loud. It's cultured, it's refined, it's civilized, but there's a proper V8 rumble to it. it. Sounds fantastic. It's such a good engine. What about the gearbox? I was expecting a proper hopeless slush matic automatic, but actually it's not bad. It's just a seven speed auto. It's not a dual clutch. I thought it was going to be dreadful, but it's not. The upshifts, they're okay. They're slightly labored, but you pretty much get them when you want them. It's the downshifts that are more of an issue. They take a long time to come in. You can count to one and two after pulling the paddle before the gearbox actually changes down. And that's an issue when you're coming into a corner hard on the brakes and you want those downshifts just to balance the car, stabilize it, give you a little bit of engine braking and you just don't get it. And actually, you don't necessarily know that the engine has shifted down a gear. I guess it's because it's not blipping the throttle on the way down. So you don't get that instant whap of engine revs. This, re <laughs> this really isn't a day for an AMG Black Series. It's so wet out there. And this car can be properly dicey, but the chassis works really well on a road like this one. And that engine is just wonderful. The UK in August. It's lovely out here. This car looks so good on the move, but if anything, it looks even more menacing when it's stationary. Just look at its stance, those massively flared wheel arches. It looks fantastic, but it's not over the top. There are no towering spoilers. There are no stupid graphics. Track widths were upped by 75 millimeters at the front and 66 millimeters at the rear, huge increases. The suspension was entirely new, as were the much stiffer springs and manually adjustable dampers, and all for good reason. You don't take on a car like the 911 GT3 without first honing and upgrading your own car in every way imaginable. Still, it takes balls to go after a car as brilliant as that, particularly with something that weighs 1,760 kilograms. This car cost £100,000 when a 911 GT3 cost 80 grand. Ultimately, it's weight plus the slightly lazy gearbox that means this thing is nothing like as sharp, as alert, as responsive as a 911 GT3. But at least it has this epic engine. It's the same V8 that you get in the CLK 63, but it's a hotter version. It's got a new exhaust system, new intake, new engine management software. It makes 507 horsepower and 465 pounds foot of torque. The Black Series will do 0 to 62 miles per hour in 4.3 seconds and top out at 186, but only because the tyres won't hold on any faster than that. This cabin is a mix of the very familiar sort of standard CLK stuff, this massively dated infotainment system here and the ventilation controls, and the very cool, really serious hardcore performance car kit, like these fixed back bucket seats that are super supportive. And then you've got these door cards here in carbon fiber with AMG sort of stamped into them. They look great, but that means there's nowhere to put your right arm. You realize when you start driving that the seat is actually not quite positioned in line with the steering wheel. It's slightly too far to the right. It's a bit annoying that, but actually having nowhere to put your right arm is more annoying still. I love this little stumpy gear lever here. It's like a little toffee hammer or something and it gets really warm, particularly when you're driving quickly. So it's quite nice just to hold on to. This engine stop start button doesn't do anything. It just doesn't work. Maybe it's just this car. You have to stop and start it on the key. The gearbox has got a few different modes. Comfort is the default mode. Press that button once and it goes into sport and then press it again and you get manual. And you can either change gear yourself by moving this thing to the left to go down and to the right to go up. I'm just not sure why you would when you've got paddles on the steering wheel. The only other thing in here that's different to the standard CLK is that there are no rear seats. You've just got these sort of big scoops 
in the back that you can't really sit in, but are maybe useful for storing stuff in. I suppose they took the seats out to try and save a bit of weight, but actually, this Black Series is no lighter than the standard CLK 63. This car has its flaws, but what it isn't lacking is character. What I like about it most, though, is that it has a special significance. It was a sign of the direction Mercedes-AMG was heading in. And look at the company now. A decade and a bit later, AMG is building some of the best and most exciting performance cars on the planet. Thank you for watching this Piston Heads Rise and Drive video. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and give this video a thumbs up. And for more of the same, head to pistonheads.com.